Hi, this is lesson four of the fine arts class uh, lectures, the music half. Um, we're going to talk about the orchestra and the conductor. Just remember, you're supposed to be writing this stuff down in your notebook, what you see and what you hear. So let's get started. Uh, on the agenda today, we're going to talk about the symphony orchestra. We're going to talk about uh, what it is, the size of it, the history, how it's arranged, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about an orchestral score what it looks like, what it's for, uh, and then the conductor, which is the person that reads the orchestral score. And I'll learn a little bit about what that job entails. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with the symphony orchestra. So the symphony orchestra uh, is the largest and most colorful ensemble in Western art music, in what we call classical music. It's big and colorful, meaning it has the most tone colors or most timbres, so it has the widest variety of instruments. Um, it started off uh, in the 17th century, so it's relatively new, if you think long term, it's relatively new. Uh, in the early 18th century, it was only 15 to about 25 musicians, pretty small, mostly strings. Um, gradually, uh, it got a little bit bigger in the late 18th century, it got to 25, sometimes pushed up to 80 musicians, uh, which is uh, quite a bit bigger, um, a big advancement there over the 18th century. In the 19th century, it really uh, got quite a bit bigger and sort of uh, stayed at a regular hundred, uh, give or take. Of course, it depends on what piece of music is being performed or anything like that, but at its largest, it was around 100 musicians, and then today, it's still roughly 100 musicians. Again, that depends. Sometimes you'll go to a symphony orchestra concert and you'll hear uh, and see less musicians than 100, but uh, at its biggest, it's about 100. So. Um, how the orchestra is seated. So symphony orchestra, like for example the Chicago Symphony Orchestra downtown, or um, like anyone in most major cities in America, uh, the New York Philharmonic, the Portland, or the Oregon Symphony Orchestra, um, all those ones, uh, they're all usually seated in just about the same way. There are three ways that they're organized. The first one is by instrument. So they're organized um, by instrument family. So not only are they grouped by instrument, so for example, all the trombones sit together, but they're also grouped by instrument, instrument family, meaning all the brass instruments are together. So, um, so the strings are together, the woodwinds are roughly together, the brass, the percussion, the keyboard instruments are uh, sort of grouped together. And the last way the orchestra is seated is by pitch, uh, which is a little harder for people to see right at first, but I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. So that means the high-pitched instruments sit closer together. Generally, they sit um, on the left or stage right. And then the lower-pitched instruments generally sit a little bit close together. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here is what um, a usual, typical orchestral seating plan is like. This is basically what you'll see when you go to see the Chicago Symphony Orchestra or uh, other symphony orchestras. So we have uh, on the bottom left here we have the first violins and then the second violins. You can see the violins are the most numerous. There are lots of them there. Uh, they don't make a whole lot of sound. They're um, quieter instruments. That's why they have so many. They often carry the melody. They're a high-pitched um, instrument. And then staying in the front row here, so we have violins. If you look right over here, uh, we have violas, which are slightly lower pitched than violins and look very similar. Uh, but they're also towards the front. Then we have cellos over here, those ones that sit on the ground. Um, and then behind them, the double basses. That means we have all the strings kind of located here in the front, right in front of the conductor, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. So strings are kind of in front from high pitched over here, the violins, to low pitched over here with the cellos and then the double basses kind of behind the cellos there. In the middle, right in this area here, we have uh, the woodwind section. So we have the flutes sitting next to the oboes. Those are uh, so the highest pitched woodwind instruments kind of in the front. And then we have the slightly lower pitched um, woodwind instruments, the clarinets and the bassoons. So they're kind of sitting right in the middle of the action here, the woodwinds. They're kind of right in the middle. Uh, behind them is the brass. So starting with the French horns right here, uh, those ones that are curled in on each other. 
And then we have the trumpets, sort of in the middle. Right next to the trumpets are my personal favorite, my instrument, the trombones, usually three of those. Uh, and then the lonely one tuba who sits sort of near the trombones there. So you, so you can see all the brass kind of make a line here. So again, to recap, we have strings in the front going high to low. We have woodwinds in the middle going high to low. And then we have um, brass going from sort of high to low. And then in the very back, very back row here, we have what's called the percussion instruments. Uh, we have all the different things, depending on what piece it's going to be. The percussion will play all sorts of different things, things like bass drum, cymbals, uh, xylophones, marimbas, all kinds of things. And then these four big kettle drums called the timpani usually sit sort of near the trombones and the tuba because they're a lower-pitched percussion instrument. And then finally, uh, we have the sort of keyboard instruments, so which aren't in every piece, but when they are, they're typically over here on the left side, behind the violins. Uh, so there's a piano, sort of the most common keyboard instrument, and then the harp, which isn't necessarily a keyboard instrument, it's kind of a string instrument actually, um, sort of behind here, which isn't used all the time in the symphony orchestra, but um, you certainly will see it. So, like I uh, mentioned earlier, they're seated by instruments, so violins together, violas together, cellos together, blah, blah, blah. You don't see one violin over on the left and one way over on the right. They're all grouped together. Like I talked about already, they're grouped by instrument family, strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion, and then um, keyboard. Uh, and then they're also grouped by pitch. So um, generally speaking, we kind of have high sounds over here on the left, high pitches on the left, with the violins, the flutes, um, the, the French horns, the trumpets, and then as we move over to the right side, we have generally have lower pitched instruments. We have trombones, we have tuba, the bassoons, uh, violas, cellos, double basses, the timpani. Um, so it kind of goes from high to low. Now it's not exclusively true, for example, the oboes sit over here, but uh, sort of on the right side, but in general, we have a high on the left to low on the right kind of setup. So there you have it. So there's one other person we haven't talked about yet, a very important a very important person. So who is it that's standing in front of the orchestra? It's the conductor. Okay, so that person right there. Uh, this picture right here actually is of um, Ricardo Muti, who's the conductor for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, one of the world's uh, greatest orchestras right here in uh, the city. And um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what the conductor does. So actually prior to 1800, um, there really weren't conductors. There wasn't anybody that did just the job of conducting. The orchestra was very small, like I talked about earlier. Um, so there wasn't really a need for someone to stand in front uh, of the group. So groups were usually led by one of the performance performers, usually a keyboard player that would sort of sit in the front Maybe you wave their arm around one arm while they're playing with the other hand or something like that. Or maybe the principal first violinist would sort of nod his or her head to um, sort of direct the group and make sure everyone stays together. So prior to 1800, there's no conductor. After 1800, um, like we talked about earlier, the orchestra grew in size. Um, became, the music started becoming a lot more complicated. Um, the rhythm and the melodies and the harmonies were all very complicated um, and it just gradually became harder for musicians to play together easily. So um, someone was needed to stand in the front and follow uh, or help everyone stay together um, to sort of wave their ha hands in the air to help keep the beat and that kind of thing. Um, now the conductor follows what's called an orchestral score. This bold word right here that you see there. Um, it's an important one to know. Your orchestral score is a composite uh, of all the instrumental parts or vocal parts in a particular piece of music. So for example, uh, I play trombone, so when I go to play with an orchestra, um, I sit in the back with the rest of the trombones near the tubas and the trumpets, um, and I only am looking at my trombone part. Let's say I'm looking at the second trombone part. I'll, I'll only be looking at that one. I'll be playing my trombone part uh, based on that, and I won't be looking at anyone else's music, just focusing on mine. The uh, conductor, however, is looking at 
all the parts put together. So he or she can sort of make uh, judgments to um, to know what every, uh, what's going on everywhere, so it can help everyone stay together. Here's an example of what an orchestral score looks like. This is just a page out of a random piece of music. Uh, notice that the instrument names are written in Italian, not in English. Um, we have Allegro, which tells us the tempo up here, and we have all these different staffs, all these different staffs, and they're, they're sort of grouped by um, instrument family, just sort of how they're grouped with the way they, they sit. We have the flutes, the oboes, the clarinets, and the bassoons, so all that top chunk there is all the uh, woodwinds. We have the brass instruments here, the um, horns, trumpets, and trombones. We have the timpani here, and then the um, strings at the bottom. So that's kind of what an orchestral score looks like. So for any one moment in a piece of music, any one measure like this one here, the conductor is looking at what everyone is doing. So it's a pretty hard job. Uh, they have a lot to look at and listen for. So, so what does a conductor do? I uh, alluded to this a little bit already. Um, you probably know uh, that the conductor waves his or her arms to help keep the beat. So they kind of go like this, maybe, to help um, make sure that the beat of visual instead of a uh, aural um, sign of, of how the beat is supposed to go. That is just basically to help the musicians stay together, uh, especially as the music became more complex over the years. Um, and another thing a conductor does uh, that doesn't always get recognition by everybody is they make artistic decisions. Um, they're the one that's in charge. Um, because the conductor has the best seat in the house right in front of the middle of the orchestra, he or she can hear um, all the instruments, how they blend, um, and can help determine who needs to play softer, who needs to play louder, and make artistic decisions on, on um, what he or she thinks is best. You know, that he or she thinks it's going to be better if the violins play louder or if they play softer, and how that's going to sort of fit into the whole framework of the piece. Um, so they have a lot to do. It's a pretty important um, job, and, and even though the conductor is the only person up there not making any sound, it's a really important job um, that has to do a lot with how the music comes out. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, what does the conductor have to know? Um, it's a good question. Um, how all the instruments work, which is pretty... that's a lot of knowledge uh, to really know the ins and outs of how all the notes are supposed to be fingered on clarinet, or how to properly hit the timpani, or all those kinds of things. So there's a whole lot of information that the conductor has to know for that. And they have to know the piece that they're conducting, backwards and forwards, because if they just stand up there and they don't know the piece uh, beforehand, then they really don't have a great idea of what to li listen for. So they have to be able to tell the form, the rhythms, the melodies, the harmonies, who comes in when to be able to help cue people in so they come in and stay together, uh, stay together, come in at the right time, that kind of thing. Um, what the articulations should sound like from a stylistic uh, perspective. Um, they have to know if anyone plays a wrong note so that they can help fix because sometimes uh, wrong notes are just written in the score. They're not, not just accidents. Um, so make sure that everyone's playing with the right timbre, make sure that it's getting the right texture. It's a very complicated, uh, very important job the conductor has. So so there you go. The recap of what we talked about today, we talked a little bit about the symphony orchestra, uh, its size, how it grew over uh, time, the history, uh, and the arrangement. We talked about how it's organized on the stage. Uh, we talked a little bit about the orchestral score, um, and the conductor who reads the orchestral score and has that sort of uh, complicated job to help everybody stay together and make the music in a symphony orchestra um, sound its best. So that's all for now. Here's a very small score that you're looking at right now. Um, and yeah, see you next time.